right, everybody, thank you so much for joining me this week. It's 5 o'clock somewhere, and it's 5 o'clock right where I'm at. Here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, it's nice enough I've got the windows open. And I've got a little bit of a Bette Midler thing going for the show because I am getting over a cold. <clears throat> so you're going to be joining me with a little bit of a sultry filter tonight. And that's okay. <sighs> so are you new to the show? Are you completely virgin to this program? Have you walked into a dark corner somewhere and you're thinking, what have I done? Where am I at? And what in the world are we going to be talking about? Well, you've walked your way into Intrepid Radio's program, Mysteries of the Mind, with me, your host, Sarah Soderland. And it's always topics of a little bit psychology, a little bit profiling, a little bit of that water that makes it all the way down the small of your back. It's, it's going that distance, and sometimes it's a little uncomfortable. And we do it with neurolinguistics, and we do it with mental mind powers. <laughs> and it's fun, and it's really exciting, and it's also free therapy. So I hope that you'll join me, because tonight's topic is one that is a little dark. Now, in the past few weeks, if you're a returning listener, I love you. And you know that we've gone into those areas of lying, fibbing. White lies. What is a lie? Is it okay to lie? Who do we lie to? Why do we lie? And we kind of evaluated ourselves a little bit. Then we took it a little bit farther down the forensic path, and last week I brought you in the mind of the psychopath. We talked a little bit about empathy, and we talked a little bit about motivations of the mind. And we talked a little bit about just who you are. And whether or not you enjoy that person or you don't enjoy that person and just being on this exploration of self-discovery and for both of us, for me mostly, um, a little bit of brain surgery, right? As you're listening to me, I get to have this connection with you that we're learning and we're we're dissecting and it's really fun. But as usual, I have to ask your permission, but of course you've already given it to me, right? Because you're here. And you're listening. And you're comfortable. And you're excited. You're a little tense. You know, it's been a little stressful lately. But you are finally listening to the program. And we're ready to begin. So tonight we're talking about guilt and shame. But we're going to start it with a little preemptive to a radio program that I host at Paramania which is called The Skeleton Key. And we talked about asceticism. We talked about mortification. Mortification of the flesh. Lately, movies like Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, Game of Thrones, um, Hollywood depictions of sadomasochistic bondage, dangerous, violent, physical behaviors... But what's right, what's wrong, what's pleasure and what's pain and is there this duality? Is there a linear spectrum? Is there one end or the other? Or is it 50 shades of gray? (laughs) Is it a gray area? Is it a no man's land? And where are you at? Where in your mind are we going to go when we start to explore guilt and shame? Well, mortification, of course, especially bringing it up on Intrepid. Intrepid is a program that's bringing you scholarly research, that's bringing you amazing people in their field, that's bringing you theology and anthropology and history and politics and in your face now with the profound wisdom of the past. And I hope that I do that in psychology. And, of course, understanding the mind of guilt and shame is understanding the seed of guilt, understanding and knowing yourself. So before I influence you, before I peel back another layer, I want to ask you, straightforward, right now, be honest with yourself. How do you define guilt? Guilt. 
How do you define shame? How do you feel about these words? That's all they are. Or are they? Oh, man, they're much more than a word, right? Guilt and shame. Well, I want you to digest over this. I want you to put it in your mouth. I want you to move it around. I want you to swallow it. And I want you to just let it digest how you feel about guilt and shame. And in the meantime, I want to introduce you to mortification, asceticism, and how religion has played into this. Because I think for most, people might associate guilt and shame with some type of a moral or religious connotation, right? Linguistics, the language of it. Where are we filing these words in our mind, right? When we double-click our computer folder and we pull up our mind, where are we going for language? Well, we're going to go to <clears throat> program files. We're going to go to Windows. We're going to go to, you know, the font, and then in the font, you've got italic, you've got bold, you've got, is it centered? Is it underlined? Is it hashed? I mean, is it highlighted? There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. And we need to double click and we need to double click and I need to know where you are storing these folders at. It tells me a lot about you. Maybe you didn't even know how much mortification and asceticism plays into our judicial system, our religious system, our political system, our society, our taboos, our culture, our superstitions, the shows that we're watching on NBC and cable. Maybe you don't realize what you love so much about that first round of American Idol and then, of course, what we also love about The Voice or what we like to see on House of Cards, right? These popular shows are utilizing motivations in your mind that maybe you aren't even aware of, but you know there's an interest. That's why you're still listening. So monks, yogis, priests, very holy people, spiritual people, revered people, would refrain from sex, drugs, alcohol, sin in any way. But what does this practice, what does this behavior mean or say about the belief Denial or self-harm. To deny yourself something, is it a biological impulse? Is it a conditioned impulse? Are you going to deny it? Aren't you going to deny it? What determines whether you do or do not? Once you do, how do you deal with it? How do you cope? Do you lie about it? Do you confess? Do you feel guilty? Do you feel shame? This is a whole cognitive process of many predispositions and many factors that come into play, but you have a large, large ability to control the majority of that scenario. And so if you think for a moment about your behaviors, if you enjoy them or if you don't enjoy them, or the behaviors of those in your life, maybe a coworker, you wish you could change that behavior. How does a mentalist, how does a hypnotist, how does a therapist how does a linguistics, how does a profiler, how does a psychopath maybe, utilize these cues, these statistical correlations that we know about certain people, these profiling, remember that's a naughty word, these indicators that we know, um, how do we use it to our benefit? Because everything is just a tool. If it's negative or positive, however you've stored that in your computer, you can always go into that folder, and if you've named it the dumb music, and you just don't even want that anymore, but maybe you want to re-listen to it under a different mindset, just let's rename the folder. And it's important to be as objective as possible, right? You don't want someone to hack into your computer and know everything about everything. You don't want to personalize everything. The folders are just there to label Let's not get crazy now. So just go through your folders and start to remove those emotional labels. Go to guilt and shame and see what you see. What do you hear? What is your mind telling you? What is your mind showing you? Do you feel like it is okay, right, moral, acceptable, ethical, understandable to refrain or deny yourself things that you love or want? 
What do you think about that? Well, mortification, an action of subduing a bodily desire. So it's more of an action. It's more of a passive word. It's more of an authoritative word. Then you have asceticism. It's more of the passive, but it's the exercise. It's the training. It's the lifestyle changes you make. It's the abstinence from worldly pleasures and the purpose of pursuing a spiritual goal. Now, asceticism and mortification typically have, that folder is typically for society labeled religious morals, right? Religious. That's kind of an emotional thing. That's a very subjective thing. Religious doesn't uh, apply to everybody. But mortification and asceticism is typically considered to be religious. And it's really common. Now, I want you to think for a second, what religion are you? Has it ever asked you to harm yourself? Has it ever rightfully said that you have to? Are you Hindu? Are you Buddhist? Are you Christian? Well, many religious traditions, yes, Hinduism, Buddhism, even Jainism, advocate restraint with respect to action of body, speech, and mind. These religions teach that a deeper level of satisfaction and fulfillment is to be found than that is offered by any sensual pleasure. And that therefore... The value of abstaining from these is a part of the pursuit of acquiring a deep inner peace. <clears throat> now, this is huge in society. This is a huge pillar. It's a huge foundational belief in almost every religion. Now, whether or not you believe in all that hokum stuff, that DNA activation, past life stuff, <laughs> Maybe you're more scientific. Maybe you're more empirical. Maybe you're more an Albert Bandera when it comes to psychology and you want to see what happens in conditioning. You need to see something to to believe it, right? You're from Missouri, the show-me state. And that's what makes it real. Well, look around you. And look at the self-harm and self-denial that we as a society, we as a species, you as a self are doing right now. What do I mean? Well, are you denying yourself something that you might really want? A bodily pleasure, a worldly pleasure? Are you trying not to be an alcoholic? Are you trying not to eat any more Twinkies? Are you on a diet? Are you no longer eating gluten? Are you on a juice fast? Are you experiencing Lent right now? Have you given something up that you truly desire? Those little vanilla wafer cookies, maybe an Oreo, in my case, a Thin Mint. That's a form of asceticism if you're doing it for a religious purpose. But what if you're just doing it for a purpose, more of a mortification Uh, but less of a Catholic thing, right? Maybe you are putting on the sweatsuit and sitting in the sauna and eating. um, We're not going to pull a Buddha here and do one uh, grain of rice a day, but you're eating, you know, chicken and quinoa at every meal with your fish oil pills and your hydroxy cut, you know, and your energy drink. You know, what are you doing and what is the purpose? That's ultimately understanding the self, Right. Well, we're going to dig a little deeper. I want you to double-click even a little farther. And I want you to go back to those specific folders of guilt and shame. And I want you to look at them. I want you to read it over in your mind. Okay, here we are, Sarah. Guilt and shame. Now, we call these moral emotions. And they are emotions. So that's likely where you have filed them. And if not, you can always move it there later. But how do you think it got there? Is it a parental conditioning? Is it a past life thing? Is it a religious thing? Is it a genetic thing? Well, how do we shame? How do you feel shame? Do you have shame? It's not very easy to measure, right? The neuro-linguistic programming of it would maybe be that guilt is associated with responsibility, And that shame is more of a moral thing. 
But what's unique about them both is that they are both emotions, but they're self-conscious emotions. What do I mean about that? Well, that's particularly important. This means that this is one of those folders that if you accidentally delete it, your computer won't work anymore. <laughs> it's that darn folder that when you first started out on computers that you were trying to clean things up and make things speed up, you know, and people said, well, just go and start defragging, you know, taking, if you don't, if you don't use it, get rid of it. And you thought, you know, wind map, shame, guilt, what's that? Delete that. And then everything just, boo. These are very important folders. <clears throat> so let's take a look, shall we? They're self-conscious, which means they're not present at birth, or at least we don't believe them to be present at birth. Currently, the only way we're measuring this is a very subjective uh, tool, a test, a questionnaire. So obviously, you have to even be literate. Um, but we're assuming up to this point, all psychologists are assuming and on agreement with that this is a self-conscious, it's not present at birth emotion, kind of like fear. You know, all of us are born with two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Everything else is learned. Isn't that interesting? Uh, that's a whole nother radio show. Um, but self-conscious means that these emotions, guilt and shame, you absolutely have to be able to recognize yourself and have self-standards. That these are the two kind of little requirements here in that code that means you have to have self-awareness. If you're a child psychologist, maybe you're an Eric Erickson fan, the psychosocial behaviors we all learn in high school in that little pyramid, the trust and shame and hope and guilt. This is happening between the ages of birth and three years old. A sense of self. Looking in the mirror. <gasps> there I am. But also having self-standards. You have a self-worth that is reflected in your behaviors. You want to do good to feel good. But that's pretty complicated, right? What makes you feel good? How do you feel good? Do your parents make you feel good? Do cookies make you feel good? Are you being bribed? Are you being taught? Are you being modeled? Are you being traumatized? There's a whole lot of factors that come into this, but there are some current predispositions that we absolutely do know for sure. And that is that society utilizes guilt and shame, and it absolutely doesn't affect current behavior or unwanted behavior in the future. Guilt and shame, when used as a negative reinforcement tool, like a disciplinary tool, either as a parent or maybe as a judge, it does not work to reduce recidivism, which means it does not cease unwanted behavior and create positive future behavior. <laughs> we know this to be true. So we still do it. We still do it as a society. We still do it as parents. And we definitely still do it to ourselves. Have you been gentle with yourself today? When was the last time you self-shamed or felt guilty about something because of a self-standard that you did not achieve or a self-reflection you did not think was positive? This is important. For example, women, oh, I'm so ugly. I just feel fat. And the husband's like, dude, you're sexy. I think you're amazing. You know, this is, let's go right now. But I don't feel sexy. And you have this, this is a self-reflection of self-worth, self-image, self-confidence, self. Everyone else in the world could, could think that you are beautiful and you could receive all these compliments. It doesn't matter. It's a self-standard. It's a dual thing, this cognitive process, which is why it's a key thing. It's not just a branch that's come off of another branch somewhere off of another branch somewhere down the orchard. This is the driveway into the orchard and the branch either to parking or back out onto the road and they go together this road it's a two-way street here and guilt and shame are very 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 important but they are self 
standards. So we're going to talk about whether you are a guilty person or a shameful person. Because typically that is the duality. That is what's on this spectrum. That is what is in our scales. You are either a little bit more guilty or a little bit more shameful. Now maybe you tuned in last week and you learned that you're kind of psychopathic. (laughs) Well, then I can probably predict that you might be a little bit more shameful. Now what does that tell me about you? What do your behaviors and your language, that's right, the words that you use and the way that you think and the folders we opened to get here, have told me already many, many, many things about you. And this is important. This is a really important tool. But what has it told you about yourself? Because remember, this is all a self-reflection. And you can change those standards. And you can change those folders. And you can rename things. You may not be able to delete this one entirely, but that's okay. We can use it and change it and be aware of it and know where it's at and access it. We can make a shortcut to it or we can make it hidden. All right. Now we've already got the permission to go deep inside. So here after the break, we are going to delve a little deeper into those folders of guilt and shame. But I want to ask you before we go to the break, what have you come up with? What do you think those mean? Have you defined them yet? Do you have your own self-definition? Do you know the difference between shame and guilt? Well, I'm really, really interested. I'm really, really interested in what you think, where it came from, and if you're feeling guilty at all today, and if maybe we can alleviate some of that guilt. And maybe if you're feeling a little shameful, we can help work with that too. And it'll be exciting and it'll be fun, but we're going to do that after the break. So for those of you listening, I encourage you to continue listening. Maybe take a break, go to the restroom, grab some popcorn, grab a friend and come back. Definitely join us on the social networking sites during the break to ask any questions or send any feedback, which you can find me at facebook.com backslash the paranormal Sarah or on Twitter with the hashtag mysteries of the mind and at paranormal Sarah. And that is of course me, Sarah Soderland, your host, as you guys are listening now to mysteries of the mind on intrepid radio. Out of Jeddah in the M&M Survivor Challenge, the sun beats down on the empty quarter. Uh, hold on, Red. I need a drink. <sighs> That's better. Hey, Yellow, go easy with that water. It's got to last till Dubai. Okay, Red. I'll be careful. Guess how many weeks it will take Red and Yellow to cross the empty quarter desert from Jeddah to Dubai and win great M&M Survival Kits with laptop, mobile phone, and GPS tracking system and lots more. Count the colors inside M&M's packs for a clue. Yellow, you crazy nut the water. It's all gone. Ow, you don't have to hit me. We'll never make it now. I remember a loud noise, and then everything went black. I was set on fire, and I couldn't breathe. I saw the fireball. Everybody was panicking. I have never been so afraid in my life. Everything changed after that. I'm Trace Adkins. I want to tell you about these true American heroes and how you can show your thanks by helping them through Wounded Warrior Project. The person who went direct is by far not the same person that came back. I was very isolated. Um, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I felt like there was no one there. There was no hope. There's this feeling of brokenness, not being the person that I used to be. I had thoughts of ending my life. Your gift today of $19 a month can help us provide the programs and services desperately needed by our wounded service members. When a person is scared and confused and alone, when a warrior project has been there to help them. The needs aren't going away. Post-traumatic stress disorder is not going away. The wounded warriors that are out there need help. They're going to be around for years to come. Call or go online with a pledge of $19 a month and you'll receive this Wounded Warrior Project blanket. I'm able to do a lot more now. I've come a long way. 
it's so much emotional healing that that goes on. It's great to know that there's an organization out there who's willing and able to help. The job of helping thousands of our wounded warriors rebuild their lives is massive. That's why your gift of $19 a month is so important. Please, call or go online right now. Welcome back, everybody, to Intrepid Radio. This is Mysteries of the Mind with your host, Sarah Soderland, and that's me. And tonight, we are talking guilt and shame, going into some interesting places kind of linguistically and learning about ourselves a little bit, where we store guilt and shame and how they got there, how those files are located and named in our big computer upstairs, and whether or not we want to maybe defrag that folder, maybe we want to reorganize that folder. But most importantly, what have we put in that folder and do we want it there? So before the break, I had asked all the listeners to try and define guilt and shame for yourself because you definitely want to have your own definition, right? You don't want to be influenced necessarily by me. All right, I'm going to come and sit next to you later and, you know, we'll influence. But right now you want to have your own definition. What do you think? Well, again, guilt and shame are all self Self-conscious emotions, self-standards, everything is about you. But maybe you have morphed words or changed sentences, had miscommunications along the way where you've put things through your filter and it's not necessarily real. It's not necessarily the truth. Or maybe it's just not necessarily helpful. So maybe you don't want it in there. Well, I want you to think for a moment in the realm of forensic psychology, which is my specialty. Um, Think about the permission that we give as a young child between the ages of birth and three years old. We're becoming self-recognized and we have parents that love us. And when we cry, we're picked up and we're loved and we're coddled and we're soothed. And we have those early psychological oh, foundations of trust and love and safe environment and our needs are met and our wants are met and yada yada. And our parents are teaching us, you're beautiful, you're so cute, you're this, you're wonderful, you're the best little toddler on the planet, you're the coolest guy, you're the smartest little boy. You start to build and allow the building unconsciously, right? You've given unconscious permission as a small infant to your parent because you love them and you feel safe. And so your central nervous system is relaxed and your mind is not on the defense. Your prefrontal cortex is not even really even developing at this point. Everything is just firing around in there new and fresh and you're letting that input in because you feel okay with it. So what about those young individuals who aren't soothed? What about the children who aren't picked up when they cry and they don't get food and they're not taken care of or loved or given shelter and they are abandoned and they are isolated and they are physically, mentally, emotionally malnourished? All the input, everything that they're learning, all the conditioned behaviors, it's not trusted They've not necessarily given it permission. So they've not built a moral foundation of right and wrong because when someone whoops them for eating food when they're hungry, they know inherently that that's not okay. And so any of the advice from this guardian or person is not taken seriously. And the guilt and the shame foundation is radically different. So think about permission. Who have you given permission to? Were you abused as a child? Did you have the ability to feel coddled and safe? And did you allow religion? 
Did you allow society, culture, grandma, grandpa, cousins, school in and tell you what's right and wrong? Do you believe in the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, the fairy tales, the Disney stories, Smokey the Bear, and forest fires? Were you trusting of friendly or positive reinforcement? Start thinking about maybe what you've stored in here. Well, in the early 1900s, there was a psychologist by the name of Benedict, and it's actually kind of been a continued distinguisher throughout the psychology field that we define shame and guilt as shame means others know about it. It's public. And guilt is more private. You feel guilty. So if you're a kinesthetic person, you're a touchy person, you love handshakes, you like to feel things when you buy them, you like to try on your clothes before you check out. If you're a kinesthetic person, you might be a guilty person. Versus if you're constantly concerned about what is my boss going to think? What are my listeners going to think? What's my demographic going to think? What's my wife going to think? What are my children going to think? What's my dad going to think? You might be shameful. So public versus private. Now feeling shame or feeling guilt in a completely solitary experience is extremely rare. It's less than 18% for shame and 2% for guilt. And it's all about awareness. So just the fact that we have double-clicked these folders, we've opened them, and we are going down inside, and you're looking, you're reading the code, you're listening to the directions here, and you're processing right now, you're getting a feel for yourself and shame and guilt, and that brings awareness. That's extremely important because the difference between shame and guilt is shame is feeling bad about yourself. I can't believe I did that. That's not me. Versus guilt. I can't believe I did that. Of all the things, I did that. It's bad, feeling bad about a behavior. We're further double-clicking these folders, right? One was public. One was self. One was self and I. One was that and a behavior. Someone who is shameful can't believe I did that. I really let myself down. There's somebody that typically, especially in a forensic setting, if something has happened, a factor, an environmental situation, a scenario, right? Because most everything is out of our control. The only thing we control is ourself, right? Our reaction to the world around us. So the world happens. It happens, as George Carlin would say. What do we do? Well, first of two things, fight or flight, right? We're, we're ingrained, fight or flight. Hide or amend. I want you to think of hide or amend. Which one do you do? Which one do you click? If you typically hide, or perhaps you have a son like me, uh, my oldest son, when he does something bad, he hides. He wants to duck out of the heat, right? He's really, really worried about uh, when other people find out what he's done. And he doesn't want to be present when that happens. Because he feels uh, shameful. Or are you the person that wants to amend it? You want to confess. You want to give your apology. You want to go to forgiveness. You want to have confessional. You want to get it off your shoulders, right? Get it off your shoulders because you can feel it. Because you're kinesthetic. Because you're empathic. Right? You worry about how it's going to affect others. God, I can't believe I did that. You know, now what's going to happen now? What's going to happen with my kids? What's going to happen with my job? How is this going to affect my life insurance? How is this going to affect, you know, what are your cognitive proce processes? Are you someone that's going to duck it and say, you know what, I'm going to have to just deal with this later. Let's just pretend this never happened and we'll deal with it if we have to deal with it. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Have you ever said that to yourself? Or is that a cliche your partner likes to use? Do you know someone who might have said that? I'm sure you've heard that before. Who comes to mind? You? Well, predispositions is what's really important. 
when you have double clicked on your folder and you're looking at all those other little files all those little files you're gonna see some files you're gonna see some emotions you're gonna see some behaviors you're gonna see all those little things that a linguistic a mentalist like me loves to see and that is maybe I've clicked shame and I've clicked self and I've double clicked hide and I've had to right click and do password secure and I've got permission to further open this and I begin to see the things you're prone to your predispositions anger hostility blames others defensive aggressive witty hostile physical abuse verbal abuse consistent behavior addict sexual risk suicidal depressed mental health anxiety compulsive vulnerable to mental health free thinkers psychopath avoidant introvert these are all little predispositions again profiling is such a naughty word but they're telling me things they're telling me that this is a person that begins to define shame bad about self with a lot of little predispositions and they can act out and maybe we don't want to do those anymore maybe we don't want to have those there or maybe we just need to know that they're there what if I double clicked guilt let's go back 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 to guilt double click we see behavior double click we see amend confess get it off our shoulders right double click amend we see empathic apology constructive anger direct corrective action the fixer the builder the hands-on the rational the analyst responsibility volunteer lifestyle resilient extrovert college little sex uses birth control no interest in drug use we start to see certain little things that you've put into this folder you didn't put them there right well What's interesting is currently right now in psychology, one of the big names in this field that if you are interested in guilt and shame that I would highly recommend you look up is Judy Tingney, and she goes through Mason University, and she is fantastic. Some of her lectures on guilt and shame highlight correlational studies, uh, longitudinal studies that illustrate correlations between children into their adolescence and into their adulthood. And the same participants had their parents and their grandparents interviewed and assessed. And the correlations and the findings that were found in some of her research is what we, even in forensic psychology, are barely beginning to use. I use it in my dissertation. Uh, but it's all about understanding recidivism. It's understanding change. So, okay, now you know. Are you a shamer or a guilter? You tend to go one way or the other. And it's not a complete scale. For some it is. But for most, it's teetering one way or the other. And it's important to know this about yourself. If someone says that you're always ducking heat, that you're always getting out, you know, Friday morning meetings when everyone gets reamed for their numbers, you always just happen to be somewhere else getting coffee for everybody, that you self-shame. And that maybe you can go into that folder and reevaluate your self standard. You're the person that put them there. You're the only person that can change them. And you've allowed someone to put that standard at a certain level that you may or may not be attaining right now. And it's okay to change it at any point in time now that you know where it's at. And you can say, I'm in school and I've got two jobs going right now and I just had a baby. My standard to be a perfectionist needs to come down from 111% because I like seeing all those ones. And I can slide it down to 82% for a little bit, for three months, I'll give myself. And you can 
self-shame a little less. And when you self-shame a little less, you stop going back to that folder and picking up little frags of anger, hostility, blaming, defensive, shame. Stop picking up those little pieces. We're defragging it, right? We're going to take some of those out. Maybe we don't need them. Or maybe you're a guilty person. Maybe you're always that person that needs to call everybody up and apologize for everything, and you always are feeling guilty about stuff, and you can't believe you did that. You know, stop thinking about all of the behaviors necessarily and start thinking a little bit more about the why. And stop distracting yourself with volunteer work and fixing the problem and think about the connection between the other person involved and what they might be feeling. You are extremely empathetic. You need to use that in your good nature. Extend that empathy on your Batman utility belt in a different direction. Up a different building, if you will. Now, I have to say before we end the show, because we're coming up slowly here on the end, which is just strange. It always goes by so quickly. That we want to change these things in forensic psychology, especially in therapy. We want to help someone change these things. How do we change these things? Because, again, they're self-constructed. Well, you have to have permission, which, again, we have. You have to be aware of what it is, where it's at. But you also have to know that it is not learned behavior. This is one of the most interesting findings in um, June's study was that many people thought, surely if someone's a self-shamer, their parents were a self-shamer. It's something they've learned. Even me, in the beginning of my research, I thought, you know, I've got a son who feels shame. He's not even three years old and he runs and hides. He has a standard of himself that he doesn't feel like he's reaching and instead of you know, telling him he's wonderful, every time he hits his brother, I'm screaming at him and telling him, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? I'm making the shame worse. Because in, in his world, when he's a shamer, it's all about him and I'm making him worse. And I was, I was freaking out and I was panicking and I thought maybe he's learning it from me, you know, because I'm kind of a self-shamer and I'm a perfectionist and I've got anger issues at times and, you know, um, I've got an addictive personality and I'm an extrovert and, uh, I thought, man, maybe my parenting style or my discipline style is that. But that's not true. Um, more than 18 years of research have been done uh, from an array of graduate students uh, and doctorate students alike. And there is absolutely no correlation between family, parenting styles, disciplinary styles. It's actually a mystery at this point. Why a person becomes a shamer versus someone who becomes a more guilty person. But as you can imagine, as a profiler, somebody who works with, you know, the FBI and the BAU and working with the Chicago School of Professional Psychology and working on some pretty amazing cases, I'm interested in these personality traits that I know about a person, not only for their recidivism, is this person likely to reoffend how, why, and when based on their behaviors, but also is this person s someone who feels guilty and is likely to change their behavior? Are they a shamer or are they a guilter? And can I tell this just from the way they're talking, from the way they're moving in their chair, from the things that they've said? Well, of course. Someone who feels shameful about a specific action doesn't want it to be put out in public. There's somebody who wants to be in their closet, who is embarrassed. There's a high level of embarrassment. And there's also a very defensive ability to blame others. Well, if the prostitute hadn't, you know, walked in front of my car when I was having a mental breakdown, I wouldn't have cut her throat. Versus someone who may have said, well, you know, I can't believe I did that, but, you know, what's done is done, and and uh, now that you've found her, you know, let's tell her family and let's get on with it. And, you know, now I know how it feels and I don't want to feel this way again and I'm not going to do it again. As profilers, do we want to put it out into the media that we have found the body? Do we want to put it out that we have a suspect in mind? Do we want to share any details of the crime? 
so many Hollywood shows, criminal minds are going to say, well, you know, you want to play to the ego of the person and you do or you don't. You know, a certain person's going to want, um, you know, recognition or credibility for their, you know, their actions. And that is true. And this actually goes down to perhaps some of those basic folders of shame and guilt. And which one is going to tell me about this person? Which one am I going to find there when I go into that criminal mind? Which one am I going to find? Am I going to find the person who's a little bit more empathetic or not? Am I going to find someone who's a little bit more angry and aggressive or not? Am I going to find someone who's going to confess or not? Do I need to waste my 48 hours in interrogation or not? You know, is this someone who's going to hide and who has con- ten- 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 continued to kill or not? These all break away from shame and guilt. Say you have a spouse that's ch- a cheater. Maybe you have a gambling problem. Maybe you are trying to quit smoking. Maybe you've dieted for 10 years and nothing ever works. Are you someone who is shaming yourself or who feels guilty for your actions? Somewhere along the way, there's a detour keeping you from your goal. And the detour is something that you have put there yourself in your mind. And you have to go back to the root of your behavior. And I'm interested if you're someone who's a shamer or if you feel guilty. Now, in the 1990s, it was really, really, really popular for our judicial system to say, gosh, dang it, look at us, America. We have more than 2.2 billion people incarcerated. More than two-thirds of those are going to re-offend within an immediate uh, parole. And we have more incarcerated people in our country than any other country in the world and through any country in history ever think about that well that's really good for me that's job stability (laughs) but it's not good for our society is it the rules do we have too many rules signs signs everywhere is a sign or is it because our judicial system is flawed and how the incarceration program works well judges in the 1990s started to try and change the way they handled things parents even trying to change the way they handle things, and especially now with technology and how s- this, the social networking sites kind of put everything out there. You know, you've got the biggest loser. Well, you're more apt to reach your goal if you are fearful of public humiliation, if you are someone who is a shamer. If you're someone who has a guilt file back there in those computer programs, it's not going to work so well. Save yourself the time. Know you, know your coworkers, know your children. Know how to communicate with the people in your life. And if you're a fellow profiler, a fellow mentalist, a fellow linguistics like myself, know the person you're debating with. Know yourself. Know the researchers you listen to. Know how you can perceive them, filter them, understand them in a whole new way by just defragging these folders in your mind. Now, is it okay to tell a child when they steal something that they need to stand outside that sore with a sign and maybe get a bad haircut or post a picture on Facebook for the entire world to see? Well, as I said in the first half of the show, we've actually learned through research, both in criminology and psychology, that negative reinforcement of the use of guilt and shame for either person for either personality. Uh, It doesn't work. People who are guilty already feel like it's been done and what's done is done and they're looking to move forward so it just becomes an anchor. And for people who are shamers, they are self-destructive. So if you give them further public humiliation and embarrassment, it makes them feel worse about themselves and it triggers the momentum and response that they have which are non-constructive and they're impulsive and they're typically angry and they're more likely to re-offend. So it doesn't work with either personality. So why do we do it? Well, it's entertaining, I suppose. We know it's not learned, so there has to be a reason. Well, for those of you listening, that's up in the air. Why do we do it? Is it a guilty pleasure? Is it an impulse control problem? It's interesting. 
it's an interesting late night discussion to have over a good cigar and whiskey because it's still up in the air. And as a forensic psychologist, I can tell you what's interesting for me is that <clears throat> if I know that that's not going to work, it saves me time. It makes me more efficient. It lets me know that maybe in future recidivism, if I have someone who's a drunk driver, for example, rather than having them stand outside with a sign saying, I killed two children here two years ago while I was drunk, that maybe this person needs to go to the scene of the crime and help clean up the bodies. And it gives them their volunteer work, and it's positive, and it's a reinforcement to understand consequences of future behavior. Well, that's going to work with someone who's a guilter. What about a self-shamer? What do we do for them? What do we do for that more psychopathic person? Well, for that, I would encourage you to read my dissertation uh, because that is my specialty, the assessment and treatment of the violent psychopath. And it's extremely interesting to me. But, of course, you're not psychopathic, are you? So we're not talking about how to change those behaviors in yourself. You're just looking to understand a little bit more of you and the people in your world and in your life and so forth. And I'm interested in your questions. And I'm interested in how you maybe have defined shame and guilt in your life. Um, because I can tell you that my dad is a guilter and my mom is a shamer. And I'm a shamer and my first son is a shamer. And I think my husband is a shamer. So we've just got a lot of shamers in our family. Um, we're not one... <clears throat> to confess often, but I have mentioned on the past in the show that that's actually something that I've tried doing in our house is uh, trying to remove the guilt. But I guess that's because it's a sliding scale, right? I have a little bit of both. So for some things on my to-do list of I feel crappy about, I want to confess those and feel less guilty about them and remove that stress, clean out that file folder, right? Stop thinking of all those things I need to fix. Delegate. Those are some things that we need to do. That's the Virgo part of me. But the shamer part of me wants to hide. That shamer part of me wants to remain isolated and keep my secrets, mysteries of the mind. Right? Well, I'm interested. I'm interested in how you will now see things in your life. Next time you catch someone doing something that you might think is guilty or shameful, or embarrassing. Maybe you catch your partner picking their nose, for example. <laughs> or whatever your relationship boundaries might be. Something that's societal taboo, something you wouldn't necessarily do in public, right? Um, for some people, it's masturbating. That is brought up a lot in some of my alternative client therapy sessions when we're talking about sexual health and what's shameful and what do you feel guilty about and what do you not feel guilty about. Um, it's really interesting. Bring the topic up and see what kind of person that person is. Are they a guilter or a shamer? And now, having listened to this radio show, you will have a little bit of interest in their mind. You'll see a little bit farther down the rabbit hole, and you'll be able to know that maybe when they're hostile and they're blaming others and they're angry for no reason and they're outwardly aggressive, that there's something that they're trying to avoid something they feel shameful for and that doesn't mean anything bad it could be a standard they didn't reach maybe they didn't get the promotion at work and that's why they're angry well it's more than that if they're a shamer they've been damaged and they feel defective right this helps you know how to talk to the loved ones in your life and i hope that tonight's show will help you teach uh, your children or yourself or your spouse how to talk a little bit more efficiently and maybe you'll talk to yourself a little bit more efficiently and next week we'll do even more in the mind but until then we'll leave it a mystery here on intrepid radio you guys have been listening to mysteries of the mind with me your host sarah soderland and i do hope you'll join me on facebook and on twitter at paranormal sarah throughout the week I hope you'll join me on my other show found at Paramania, and I especially hope that you'll join me here next week at 5 o'clock every Thursday, Central Standard Time for Mysteries of the Mind. Until then.
This show has been produced by Midwest Radio Production.